So you excite the molecule, you release the electron, goes, one of the spinning electrons goes from the lower state to the higher state, and then to other molecules, and then when it drops down in one big jump, now when it put blue light, we are not getting fluorescent because it very quickly goes to this lower state. <coughs> and from there it jumps down. So we, we put blue light, we put color of light, ultraviolet light, or whatever, wherever the elect electron is, it jumps goes, and fluorescence comes out from red state. Now in a living leaf, since we want to do photosynthesis, we are doing photosynthesis, most of the light is for photosynthesis, and very little will be lost as fluorescence or as heat. However, when we extract chlorophyll from the leaf or any or photosynthetic organism, then the is not doing photosynthesis. And then the chlorophyll is giving the last chlorophyll. So now, the second point, which I will demonstrate in a moment, I will <coughs> Uh, so if you have too much chlorophyll, so you have you change the concentration of chlorophyll from very low to medium to high. Now one normally expects as you increase the chlorophyll concentration or any pigment, a fluorophore, then the fluorescence is linearly increased. But it doesn't. The reason it doesn't is when you have a thicker solution of suspension. Then the fluorescence that is coming out from the middle of the tube is reabsorbed, meaning thereby everything is absorbing. So fluorescence is like light, just like normal light. So fluorescence is reabsorbed, and you get less fluorescence in a more chlorophyll than more fluorescence in more chlorophyll. Right? So uh, you will see, uh, hopefully. Uh, Maybe we need uh, to turn all the lights off, is that possible? <coughs> now can you see? I don't know. Yeah, in your head. Yeah? Isn't it this great? Glow. We also call it glow. Is it after glow? No. Why? Remove this? It's not good, right? No light, right? After glow is if it was coming from triplet state, then it will be phosphorescent. And then when you remove it, then it will continue. But I didn't bring any phosphorescent. Okay, so that's one. Uh, let's look at this one. <coughs> well, it's all good, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, don't look at the ultraviolet light. It's a dangerous to your eyes. Now, look at the net. Now, do you see more or less? Yes, yes because it's a higher concentration. Oh, of course. Okay. Now, I don't know if we're going to beat. I don't think it's a beat, but. <coughs> Anyway, it is less. I, I'm not just looking at it. I don't know. Well, anyway, you can see it's very low. Right? Mm -hmm. Believe that. So we were going to do an experiment that really didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You can turn the lights on. We'll talk about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I made a mess. Uh, I think they, we didn't need the uh, in the solution. I should have picked up at least. So anyway, the leaf gives you less. It's not simply because of reabsorption. Not simply because of reabsorption, but because it's doing photosynthesis. See, really. Now. So if you want to study the effects of herbicides, uh, can we have some light? Uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but uh, 
you need an assistant. Because I, I want to explain still uh, what will happen to birds if you are trying to see if you kill photosynthesis. So we said when you when you have no photosynthesis here at the solution, you have lack of fluorescence, correct? Because there's no photochemistry. Now let us see if we will kill photosynthesis, what should happen? Anybody? Huh? It should go up, right? Yeah. So now, so the part I will show you, when you kill the so here is the Z scheme, which we have been talking about forever. <laughs> the carbon fixation is going to be passed by the Here. So when we put diode on a DCU and actually in another arbitrage, then it kills photosynthesis somewhere here. Diuron simply displaces the QB, and so you kill photosynthesis. And QA becomes Q minus, stays Q minus, and the reaction cannot take place, and therefore photosynthesis is high. So we kill photosynthesis and make photosynthesis as we expect. However, if we kill photosynthesis by a different means, like here, you take your leaf and you heat it. And the heating destroys the oxygen of the process because it's very sensitive to it. So what happens? You expect, well, we kill photosynthesis, we should get high chlorophyll, just like this in the world. You get the opposite. So that's one thing. I want to be sure you see the point. Why opposite? It is opposite because the chlorophyllate fluorescence in photosystem is dictated by the openness or the closeness of the reaction center. So when you have QLS here, then it becomes totally closed, and the QA is QA minus, reduced QA minus. And the theory is, and it was given by Joyson of the Netherlands, that QA is a quencher of process. So we have to learn the idea of a quenching of the process. It's a quencher. It quenches, means, like you quench your thirst, it quenches the light. Yeah? So it's a quencher of the process. And so when you have QA minus, process is high. Now, when you block it here, electrons cannot go at all. And you will have P680 plus, remember? Because it is not getting any electrons, the P680 plus. And that itself is also a quencher. I have studied that for a paper with many other people, Warren Butler, those who are the people. So, therefore, now, however, let us do another experiment. We have this whole thing running, and we put a herbicide called Paraquat, which is methyl biology. What do you think is going to happen? You have more photosynthesis. And so, of course, it is in the right direction. Process is low. But why is it low? Not because of you. You are pulling electrons. The paraquat, which is called also metal biologin, picks up electrons from one of these electron pairs, pulls it out, keeps pulling it out. What does it mean to the QA? The QA remains oxidized. Because the pull. The whole system one is very high. Yeah? Is it everybody with me? That's more important than giving it over. Yeah? All right. So now uh, we're done with it, and you can have games with it. So I, I will not anymore show you, and you can have fun doing your own thing. And, uh, you know, Excuse me, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, we will have more fluorescence when we block with uh, methyl biologen, paraquat. Absolutely opposite. Huh? Absolutely opposite. Let me explain again. So you listen carefully now, all right? I'm glad you asked the question. So the paraquat <laughs> is pulling electrons very fast, much more than the normal photosynthesis. Because it's a one electron acceptor, it just keeps electrons. As soon as 
So when it pulls the electron, this mean photon system one is the QA is never allowed to remain as QA minus. So QA is always so this thing continuously kept open. The fluorescence is low. The fluorescence does not rise. The opposite. But the overall photosynthesis is not happening, sir. Absolutely. Not. After paraquat, there yeah. is no production of, of NADPH. Course, of, course. of course, but that's not the point of the discussion. The point of the discussion is how to relate reactions with chlorophyll fluorescence. Of course, we don't, we don't care. There is no photosynthesis for TCMU or heat or paraquat. Anyway, but there are different effects of these three things on chlorophyll fluorescence. If you block here, you have QA minus, fluorescence is high. If you block here, no lot of QA because it's not being reduced, fluorescence is low because QA is a quencher of fluorescence. Now, if you pull it here, it keeps going, it never allows QA minus to accumulate on the QA with the quencher of fluorescence. Okay? All right. But if you have still doubt, you can check over a copy. Yeah. Huh? All right, so now, what is it? Why are we even interested in it? The reason we are interested in it is because it's a carbon We are interested in it, by the way, there was some mistake who wrote me, uh, you know, Sayyid, Sayyid, did you hear? So, but you're supposed to stop it, right? I, I looked at the... Yeah, after the question. But I don't remember what it was, but I remember your name. Uh, we should... I should be able to help you whatever your question is, all right? Okay, so... Question? <laughs> <laughs> we want to... So, what, I, I would like you definitely to visit my website. And, more importantly, there is a whole book on chlorophyll fluorescence. It is in the library, in the biology and school of life and for life. It is there for you. Okay? It is not a basic book, but it is a very good book. George Papa Giorgio, who is my first PhD student, I had a book published in 2004, and there was so much demand that it was reprinted in 2010. Very few advanced books there. So that is in the library. There are many other books, old books, one in genomics, one in something else. I forget you have, uh, you can if you remember. Uh, so please go to the library and there are these books. Some of you have not given a presentation, may find something interesting there rather than what I'm teaching. Two of you gave a talk of what I'm teaching. It's not so much fun. But it's okay. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So what I'm saying is it may be interesting for the whole class if you talk about something different than I haven't talked about. So uh, the whole course is a, you know, more broader, right? But it's okay. Whatever you want to do, it's your business and it's good. But you feel comfortable. So please do use the library. Please do look at the book and see if there's anything. Right? Elements of style, the book, How to Write, is also already on your Google Drive. Download it. It is a very good book. Tells you the, the Blankenship book is there. You cannot download it because it's really big, but you can read it. Or whatever. My book is there, so please, we are trying to give you as much material as I can get from my side. You don't have to read it. All right, so let us, I, so my website also is. Some interesting things, including books, including pictures. Excuse me, sir. Okay. Ah, please. Sir, one more doubt. Ah, please. Sir, uh, when is the case when we won't get any fluorescence? Is it when we. Uh, say it again. So, when is the case when we get no fluorescence? Is There's that never, a... never any case when you get no fluorescence. Okay. Why? Because if we uh, inactivate the water evolving complex, mm -hmm. then we get no low, fluor low fluorescence. Low fluorescence. Why? N never say never. Yeah. Why? Why? Because the light <laughs> is absorbed by many pigments. All right? Correct? Yes. And it is being transferred from one to the other to the other. Before any chemistry takes place, mm. there is 
always a probability of energy transfer, which is very high, a probability of some loss as heat, and probability of some loss as force. So there's always a small probability of loss, and we call it the minimal fluorescence, the F of fluorescence, which is F. You cannot. Right. So then, all, so in which case we get less fluorescence when we inactivate the water evolving complex? Or you we, tell me. We, yeah. we I just explained it to you. Tell me the answer. <laughs> so you will see. It. Pay attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When QA is reduced, no, in case of paraquat and forget water about water. paraquat. Yeah. You have if you get the basic point, then you will yeah. have the own answer. Yeah? yeah. So if you put, let's say heat, as you said. No electrons are flowing from water to PS2. Mm. The QA remains in a QA oxidized state. It is the quencher of fluorescent means, it. so it's a low fluorescence. When you put DCMU and it takes the QB side, you have electrons coming and mm -hmm. QA is reduced, fluorescence is high because the quencher is not there, only QA minus. When you put paracord, you are pulling electrons out of the system constantly, you're never allowing your QA minus to be high. All right? Therefore, for instance, you okay. can talk to me later. Yeah. All right? Uh, okay, so. Um, I, I, okay. <laughs> All right, so this started. This is, I think, from my Scientific American article in 1974. That's uh, the Scientific American stuff. Right. So you see, they're putting us a light on the top. And it is a beautiful picture, one of the most beautiful pictures of course, as you can see, the uh only from the light that went down and then it didn't go down there. So here I showed you before, uh, this is a book I mentioned, Papa Giorgio and myself, we printed Chlorophyll of Fluorescence and Signal for the Pollution, in my series in volume 19. So this is Professor Galea, I showed you stuff, and it showed you the fluorescence spectrum, uh, emission spectrum of the leaf fluorescence. Band should be high here, this band, so it should be like this, really. But it's low because it has been absorbed, reabsorbed in the leaves before it could be ever met. So reabsorption of fluorescent explains changes the spectrum, and you can use that idea to understand. So this is the scheme again, uh, which you will see, but the focus is different. We have already seen when I explained to the class, which Half the class was not there, so I don't know what to do unless you go and, and come back and I can explain again, but I can't take the time today. But we went through the, all the steps and how far they are in the class the other day. The PS1, photosystem 1, absorbs a much longer wavelength than photosystem 2. That's what it means. Then the second point to remember, the photosystem 1 fluorescence is much lower than photosystem 2. Why is that is a different question. People have not yet figured that out, but there are many things. Yeah. We won't go into that in this case. Yeah. So because of that, we we are lucky that we can. But that doesn't mean it is not there. It is there, but it is a different wavelength. It is a longer wavelength. It's much smaller than for ten times smaller. Than for so we make use of and exploit this situation. The second thing is at low temperature, so at 77 degrees Kelvin, I think we worked on it in the 1970s, uh, at 77 degrees Kelvin, and even going out to liquid medium temperature, 4 degrees Kelvin, we can do beautiful fluorescent spectra. And we can tell which fluorescence is coming from which system. Okay. Now, so uh, we, we shall not belabor the point, except to tell you that, and here's it, what is wrong with this diagram? See, there's always things wrong with every diagram, no matter who makes it, including myself. Why? But I want to make a diagram to focus it on, to leave out something. So since I had to put all the time space and all that, I got tired. 
I put in the antenna. So yeah, as you see, uh, the, the point about somebody misunderstanding the basic safety of sounded like is one of them could be this diagram, my own diagram, because I'm showing light going to physics safety. So I'm being a bad boy. <laughs> right? So what I'm telling you, <laughs> where is it? But it is not that I don't know it. It's because I sit so do not trust any diagram because they are done to simplify things to present some point of view. Right? So now, having said that, let me move to the next. So let us look who were the guys behind us and who discovered this thing. There was a man named Sir John Herschel who the picture I'm not showing because we don't have sonic water today. You know, some of you drink alcohol, engine and sonic. I don't anymore, but 30 years that way. Um, and you know, sonic water is for nine by sulfite or something like that. And this John Herschel in England, or Scotland, I forget, uh, or the United Kingdom, I should say, saw a light, blue light coming out from solution. Well, I don't know if there's something that they feel worse about. So he described that there's a discovery of a genius celestial blue light. It was a beautiful, but I didn't uh, bring that slide because uh, I may at the end if I have time to show you. So, but then there was Sir David Brewster. Now, now that's a sir. <laughs> he gets a knighthood. And here, where is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And here is a yes, sir from the English, the British side. Sir David Brewster. In 1834, what are that? Sir David Brewster, a Scottish preacher, and more, a lot of things were discovered with preachers, and, you know, who were from in, the, in church. Uh, and discoverer of kaleidoscope. You remember, no kaleidoscope. First noted the red emission from process extracted from laurel leaves. He re extracted from spinach and he had extracted this from laurel leaf. And you can see the model. While discussing its concept of the color of natural bodies, he remarked almost in passing in making a strong beam of light, sense light, pass through the green fluid, I was surprised to observe that its color was a brilliant red. It was a beautiful thing to look in a time complementary to the green. So what I have are the pictures here for you. So that's that. That's a Newton, and this is a normal smile. So this Newton is what? And it's a high school that I took. This is a close look for instance, uh, in the original early times, how they did it in spectra. They do not have spectra. Here is a picture of four people with a leaf. And that is Rudy Schreiber, whose machine you all use for pan fluorometer, wall fluorometer. He is the one who is behind That's Rudy Schreiber. This is Paul Polkowski, who has done book on quadric photosynthesis, photosynthesis of the ocean. And uh, in the middle is Ali Bjorkman, one of the great scientists working on how plants protect them from certain exercise and that means an aquarium. So what is this? So a leaf, you can take a leaf and to make a picture, as I said in the side picture, you can even do some stories, but I won't discuss the detail of how you do it. Anyway, so therefore you can have fun with that science. And there is Sir George Gabriel Stokes, 1819 to 1903. And it's 1852. By the way, it, there could be mistakes when I type sometimes. I mean, so please do not trust everything that you get, which is very mistake. Professor of Mathematics. This one didn't think so. Professor of Mathematics, not a biologist and a physicist. At Cambridge University, is well known for the discovery that the emission bands are shifted. The wavelength longer than the crossing band. Called the Stokes shift after me. But you need a sound too. Nobody needs a sound too. He also discovered both the microbillion and chlorophyllin collection in fresh red algae from the ocean, the collection of stuff 
so basically, these are the five years behind. Most most researchers um, are not interested in telling you about because it's too far in the back. None of us were born or know about. But I think, from the point of view of having fun in the science, it's good to see these people. So the top chip that you see is a total man and little man. The chip is the lower range. Why? Because you excite and you have an en some energy loss. <laughs> very quickly with tantal myocytes, <coughs> and then the fluorescent takes a better energy. So that was the stuff we have. There's another named Kalski, Hans Kalski. What was Kalski say? He went into a room, dark room, and he cut some samples for the synthetic samples. It's totally dark. And then there was a hole in the room, and he sat there, and he had a, some kind of cover for the hole, some you know, sunlight was coming. He removed the cover, and he washed the leaf with his naked eye. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, we don't do those uh, interesting synthesis experiments in the park. So what did he see? What did he see? That part, as if there was nothing, and then the person goes. And, and then he put the leaf or whatever it was on the leaf, put a 30 degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius, and then you start to sign that. Because that time is dark, and then what keeps people up? That's a poison. And I think that person didn't do much for the leaf. So when you don't see a result, that doesn't mean it, it's not a good result. So basically, this is a schematic representation of what he wrote in a text. A chlorophyll changes in leaf as well as the sun in order to take a night at 30 degrees, using poison return, and it was published in 1921 in Germany. So this phenomena of fluorescence changing of life has now been named the Hubs. So this is, a, many of my slides are repeats, and as I say, the first is not going to have to go on. Of course, but you won't see it, because the, the light is mixed up. But if you were to bring the uh, glasses that would only see red light, and so you turn the sun off, and then you look at it, and it's Turn the sun on and you will see it. And many people do. <laughs> but you see, in order for you to see, you have to have a control, but that's not. Yeah, well, maybe we can have fun. Yeah. So, anyway, to go back to the energy level diagram, I repeat myself. So, this is the S, they call it singlet. This is nothing to do with the oxygen equality in college states, remember? This is a singlet state, the first singlet excited state, the second singlet excited state, and this internal conversion block. So, put on them there, get that, and then zoom it comes back, and it's red, and it's blue. So, it collides with other molecules, it is an energy field, and it's red, and it's a stopping. So, this is a repeat, I myself a repeat. So, now what, how do we know how much for So, we define a term to say, what is the quantum, we, we learn about the quantum yield of oxygen. <coughs> how many oxygen comes out with how many photons? Right? So we want to know what is the quantum yield of fluorescence. The solution, let's say, is 0.3, 30%. And so, oops, which other one This was a screen session sponsored by Wave. Thank you. All right. So, what is the quantum yield of fluorescent fluorescence? Well, normally you say, I put in 100 photons and see it comes out. However, in reality, we saw the excited state. It is related directly to the rate constant of E excitation from the excited state by the different properties. So, quantum yield of fluorescence in real terms. Can be quantitated equals 
the rate constant of fluorescence divided by the sum of the rate constant of fluorescence plus heat plus temperature. And the two will match if everything works. So I showed you this slide to, to emphasize to you that when when you have the antenna, and this is let's say the P6 basically, the reaction center, when it is open, you have a certain amount of fluorescence. And when it is closed, you QA to Q minus fluorescence. So this is just a diagram to make the point. This is one of my favorites. I showed you this picture and I repeat, and when there's a question about the equation, so today I brought the equation for you. You know what that. Yeah? Yes, sir. So here are the same guys, Parker and Bob, no? And they uh, did this, this fun thing to the Christie, you know, showing Christie to students. And to one of the pioneers who was there between the USA. So the theory again to repeat the three major parameters. One was a distance, hard to repeat. Kappa is far, Kappa is only 60 over the distance. So this is now let us see. It's difficult to read because I simply copied it from one of my uh, lectures. That those all the lectures are there in the internet. Uh, I think as well as in my web. Uh, There's about 12 sessions of the census were done in 1998. Or something like that. So now, so the energy transfer from the donor to the acceptor. It related to some constant, but r to the zero is going to r to the zero. r to the zero is 50 percent of the power. So r to the six, r zero six is equal some number and some refractive index constant and the overlap between the sources, the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. And the process of the door. So why is overlap? Because something can go when there is energy overlap. So you have up to here and you have here, uh, well, nothing will go. But if you have an overlap, then energy will move. And this is determined by the shape of the spectrum and the overlap integral of the So uh, anyway, if you want to copy the formula, just download it and, and you will have it. So, hopefully. All right, so this is basically what is the orientation parameter? Let's okay, check here, kappa is quiet. Kappa has to do with it. We all talk about the two molecules. If you talk about multiple molecules, you, you, the equations are very different. So you, you have molecules that, uh, that are uh, dipole in this direction, dipole in this direction, dipole in this direction, dipole in this direction. Parallel opposites, and so you can calculate because you know the equation cosine alpha minus c cosine beta one cosine beta two, and that gives you what is called the maybe, maybe I took it from my own from my own book, uh, which is 1986. So, anyway, so because these are the two parameters, and those are the quantities which come that for the theory of as always. So, no, it is so. When energy is being transferred, let us say from FICO sign in to allo FICO sign in, because where these gaps are big. But when molecules, as I said last time, are together, and as if they're one single big molecule, then there is a coherence. And this, this equation does not come from the distance. <laughs> So the threat, which is means personal resonance energy transfer. Personal resonance energy transfer competes with all other processes equal to the So how do you calculate efficiency? Which as I said works in some cases, but in all cases, personal theory has been modified. So it's called master equation and so on and so forth. But we won't discuss. We want to be sure the basic thing. So it has been plotted here the efficiency of energy transfer and donor of the And in many cases, it's about five nanometers, 
After that, there you go. They feel that. Okay, so now how do you look at an energy chart? What is it? So you feel it is happening. Maybe you can have a little more light here, it's okay. Would you like more light? Because I don't want anybody to be sleeping. <laughs> otherwise, I don't want to be maybe dreaming or I don't know. No, I, I think more light is better, right? Very good. Ah, okay, see you soon. All right. <coughs> Who is this guy? <coughs> that girl. Very nice guy. Who is this woman?
positions and you could have been cut assigning and cut in one to the other to the other. So this way you can see as time goes what happens one person decreases or you can say the other way around you are with time this person increases with respect to this this person is higher than this okay. are you with me so you can see this increasing and with the relative to that now with time uh, this is not such a very good picture, but if you believe me, I, I have a good picture. The point that I'm making is that you can do the whole spectra showing the person to phytosine going down, person to phytosine going up, and the person of phytosine going up, and this all going down, and then so to this. So this, this is not a, the one diagram that I wanted to show you, but it gives you the idea how this experiment is done. And if you have the time on this side, you pick a second, and you have the time on this side. All right? So now, how do we prove in simple experiments? Because uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, well, how do you do that? Well, you don't have to do that to measure efficiency of energy. Simple experiment done long ago in the Netherlands. One of the pioneers, I mentioned his name, Zulu Doisen. So what did he do? So let us say, I will explain it to you. So he, you have two wavelengths, and let us say, this is the wavelength of the molecule A, and this wavelength of the molecule B. This is the wavelength of light, this is the intensity of absorption, and it's not true. All right, As we are looking at fluorescence of this, so we, here, let's say this is phycocyanin and this is chlorophyll. Phycocyanin is cyanide by chlorophyll. So now we have normalized the curve here to see what is happening. So I let's say give you 100 photons and in a steady state, no photosynthesis, no femtosecond, no picosecond, no nanosecond, just normal. So I give you 100 photons and out of 100 photons, you have now 50 photons. So we just measure the intensity of fluorescence to know what's going on. And from that, in the steady state, we can calculate what is the efficiency of energy. So let us say you were close to B, you were close to A. If I put in 100 photons, I discovered all the 100 photons. Therefore, the efficiency of energy comes from. Is 100 photons. If I gave, let's say to you, 100 photons, and let's say you are carotenoid, you're not giving yellow, but I'm going to see. So you can, uh, 100 photons, and then up comes only 20 photons over there in the first day, which means the efficiency of energy comes from this carotenoid. So you can do the efficiency in simply steady, steady state of current, and simple way is simply to normalize. So what is this is called the excitation step. Instead of measuring absorption, you simply give a different wavelengths of light and look at fluorescence from the acceptor final acceptor. So anyway, if you I, I don't want to read for myself, no? <laughs> so you can ask an easy Now what we can use fluorescence for. We can use persons to understand many things. We can use persons to understand all the reactions that are going on in the entire photosynthesis. We can use persons to understand how plants are protecting the process. The persons is a big thing. So this, what is this? So you take a plant, or take a leaf, or a pea leaf, or a spinach, or whatever you have, and you kept it in total darkness. And you have a machine that measures fluorescence. You have 685 nanometer system that will look at light coming out of it. So you put in light and you put the plant or the leaf, pea leaf, whatever, right, in darkness, total darkness. And I put in light. And what happens? You see the fluorescence coming up and then coming down and then going up and coming down. And this is what I have in my life. Look at this. 
So we what we call a name all the way from time to memorial. Okay, so we say O. This is the photo system one person and always then photo system two person that does not react to it. So we call it F zero or O zero for me. And then it rises up to what we call the P for the peak and comes down the P to the permanent foot. And we can use this. So we call it, uh, uh, it was started in I, uh, 1993. <coughs> the term O, J, I, P, P. P was already named by Jean Laval in France. O, I think it's also Laval in 1960, early 60s, or 59, maybe. P is still living in France. Very nice place. I think it's really, it must be over 90. Variable person. You just saw. So this is variable person. Maybe it varies, so that's why I call it variable person. Then there is a constant person. The photo system one does not react to any reaction. The photo system one is constant. It's good for us because then we can understand things. And so at F0, we have both. So that's a very, so she divides the variable person, O, P. We, so we call it variable, F, F, P, variable, which is equal to F, P minus F, P. Okay, are you with me? Just subtract. And you divide by the maximum person. So F, P divided by F, max, which is the P. That is interesting. Because that seems to measure the quantum yield of photosystem people. There are many, many experiments done that show the relationship between the measured quantum yield of photosystem two, which we can measure, and as we have done. So this is today being used by a lot of people in field conditions and everywhere to say how good your plant is, how good is the resistance to the field. Now, every time I say anything, I, to, I cringe a little because I know that there are so many other conditions in which this relationship. So you have to always remember that no matter how complicated the plant, you may not be right. So you have to check. Yeah? All right. So the second point I'm making, total person. It is nanosecond to microsecond of the single turnover light plant that measures electron transport from one side to the reaction point of So you make, you put in a flash of light, you make these specific spikes very quickly. <coughs> then the electrons start, you learn the oxygen pump, right? Then the electrons come in and then here. And Oxidizing, uh, reducing the pH, and that has to take place in nanoseconds to microseconds, and we can study the whole process. Now, we also know that in single flash, in two hundred microsecond time scale, the electrons are going to Q minus. As I said, the first flash will go from Q minus to QB. After the second flash, it will go from Q minus to B minus. And it will be slow because there's a negative charge. It's still slow. 300, 200 picosecond, 200 microsecond to 600 microsecond, or something of that nature, two or three times slow. So we can measure that by giving a flash of light, microsecond. And then the area of the flash, so here is it. Area of the fluorescence. You can measure the area of the fluorescence. And why is this fluorescence doesn't write immediately? 
So you have a chain here, right? You have QA to QB and then to what left of and all that kind of thing going on and on. And so the concentration of pure minus is changing. And until this plus of canal is filled up, there's several molecules across the canal. Until that fills up, the thing is still going on. So basically, what the area here measures is a total concentration of the electron acceptor. So there's another use. So if I, if I put a DC and mu, the herbicide I told you, what will happen? The electrons are not going from Q minus to Q. So you must be able to predict what happens. The fluorescence will rise, rise immediately, because Q minus has become Q minus, and it can't give electron to anyone else, and therefore it remains as Q minus. Decrease, total decrease. Yeah, so for instance, rises from here to here. And the area here, there's an area here. It's totally decreased. That means that you can measure the number of electrons, number of plus of no molecules. Why? Because fewer minus is a one electron process, because this area means one electron is more. And now we measure total area, and you have 10. 10 times the 20 times area, that means you have 10 molecules of plastic alone. The two, it takes two electrons, 10 molecules of plastic. So you can measure the content of plastic. Okay? So that's. All right. The curve changes during P to S transient. Let's perturbation. I've shown you that later. Yeah. So you, the fluorescence went up, you see, oh, okay, I think. And by the way, you have to plot in a log scale to be able to see that, otherwise don't close together. It goes up and comes down, and then goes up again and comes down. So we call this a first wave of fluorescence and a second wave of fluorescence, and they give you different results. So now, and then we reflect perturbation, and then reflect something else, which you were discussing for like a minute. You will have to stop me. Uh, so let me just explain briefly the state. Then you will see some data. So let us say mu are for two, mu are one, and you got some extra molecule. You have them. And so when I put in light, I reduce QA to Q minus. And then you become plastic molecule. So when I have more photosystem to light, I made more plastic molecule. Now that induces another enzyme, kinase, which then if you are a light harvesting two whoever wants to be, you be light harvesting two mobile and say you are phosphorylated and you don't there are many negative charges and you don't like the place. It's ah, 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 negative charges and move away. So you move <laughs> from photosystem two complex. So there is a physical movement of some mobile material. One now, since photosystem two is highly fluorescent, and one and since you're giving the same light, the fluorescence will change, and more fluorescence will be from photosystem one. But if I did the opposite, the opposite will happen, and there'll be more fluorescence from photosystem. So there is discovery the state change. So finally, uh, it is a non-invasive and a highly sensitive tool because we're not going to add any chemical. We're just going to study the first. All right, so the DCMU. Now you can see. So here's the control. And then and now we're just not bothering with the old DIP. We're just putting in a linear scale. And the control. And if you could put this in me, Immediately high in this area into the one electron. Now, if you put the move on, the move on, you make it an oxygen condition. So, what happens? The first thing to move high. And we can discuss this later. And you have to tell me uh, a little while before. 
So now we talked about donor side in it. So I'm going to now I'm giving you experimental results to prove my point that I'm not lying. Yeah? <laughs> I myself don't know this All right, so here there's something as I mentioned in very briefly quickly, the chloride is needed for running up. So if you remove chloride and you are stopping water. So in this experiment, I can forget to maybe it was actually uh, on my postdoc really specific thing. So when there's no addition, the chloride depleted to the system. And you add back to the water, you start. You can do the same thing with heat. If you heat the system, because you're killing it. Heat is certain temperature. And, and then this, this paper shows, uh, this work shows, this we have to see what we have happens here. I'm guilty of that. The chloride, nitrate, and bromide are approximately both recovered by chloride. And you don't add nothing up. Chloride is death. It kills. Now, I mentioned to you. The relationship of variable fluids to microbial fluids. And this is the talk from Bernard Jati to France, Jamari Guyanfe, who was my postdoc many years ago, and Neil Becker in England. And that is cited many times. So here is a kind of relationship between this variable fluorescence we talked about between different language. It is delta F D with the variable to the F max yeah? as a function of the quantity of Q to the system in the system. So this is the one which is very cited many times. So that it, however, there are many papers that John Keith, John Keithman and about on many places, and many some of them as well as other places, uh, show that this relationship has not always function because it's a distant relationship. Because future fixation is happening somewhere else, and something else can goof up the relation. I think I can stop here. Isn't it? Good. You tell me. Is that, is that you? Oh, one fifteen. Oh, I'm up. Okay. So we'll see you uh, tomorrow, and I'll continue with this. Uh,